garbage disposal. What do you do? Don't create garbage, right? So it all depends on what we do every single day. Prevention is the new treatment. Last year, I uh, went to the Alzheimer's International Conference and for the first time, instead of focusing on those you know, crazy molecules, the plenary talk where 5,000 neuroscientists and neurologists were in the room, the first talk was this, prevention is the new treatment, that lifestyle factors are the best and the only bet now for reducing dementia risk, which is incredible. Let me show you a couple of papers that they actually presented. So something like this came up. They said, can dementia risk due to genes be counteracted by adherence to a healthy lifestyle? If we eat a healthy diet, if we exercise, and if we sleep, does it make a difference? Let's see. So they looked at about 157,000 individuals from the UK. They were about 60 years and older, and they were followed for six years. 668 of them developed dementia, and they found out that people who had the genes, remember the genes that I showed you last time? If they had the genetic risk, their risk went up by 60%. So they were 60% at a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. But if the same individuals had the genetic risk and on top of it had unhealthy lifestyle, their risk went up by 360%. And then the same population, when they did analysis, if they had healthy lifestyle, they reduced their risk by less than 30%. So it makes sense that lifestyle actually turns on and off those genes that we carry. We're all genetic beings. Everything we do is genetic. Even my driving is genetic, I say. But it's what we do that matters. So adherence to a healthy lifestyle can offset the genetic risk. Another paper, to what extent does the combination of lifestyle factors reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease? A lot of us say, you know what? I have arthritis, I can't exercise, but I can eat better. You know, and some people say, I can't quit smoking, but I'll just exercise. So how much of the lifestyle actually matters? So they looked at the Chicago Health and Aging Project and Rush Memory and Aging Project, huge research studies in Chicago and Rush University. They were followed for nine years, and they created what we call the healthy diet or the healthy lifestyle score. They looked at diet, the Mayan diet, which is a hybrid of Mediterranean diet that is low in salt, lots of vegetables. They looked at exercise, more than 150 minutes of exercise every week. They looked at smoking cessation, cognitive engagement, you know, like you guys, you're cognitively engaged right now, and then focusing on reducing alcohol, minimal alcoholism. And they found that compared to people who didn't adhere to any of these factors, any of these healthy factors, people who adhere to about two or three of them lowered their risk of Alzheimer's disease by 39%, but if they adhered to four or five of these factors, they reduce their risk by 60%, which is incredible. I don't ever remember giving high fives to people during conferences, but we were up on our chairs and like, yes, finally, the thing that we've been saying for 15 years, that Alzheimer's is preventable, they're acknowledging it. And you have to remember, five years ago, when we wrote the book, we wrote a book called Alzheimer's Solution. We were invited to BBC Breakfast and they stopped us. they like, no, this is very controversial. Alzheimer's cannot be prevented. I don't think this is true. They had never read our book. They didn't know that we had about more than 350 references at the end of the book. But, you know, our segment for the, for the interview was cut down from 45 minutes to 10 minutes. The saving grace was we met ABBA, which was really exciting. So that was good. But, you know, we've come today where they're saying that 60% of dementia can be prevented. And we say, my husband and I, our research at Loma Linda University and my research at the California Teacher Study shows that 90% of Alzheimer's disease can be prevented within our life, uh, lifetime. So we have two paths. We have the red line and the green line. The red line is the common line that we see, unfortunately, in our communities nowadays, where your cognitive function is pretty high when you're in your 30s, and then you know, by your mid-30s, it starts going down. And then by your 50s and 60s, you're at a high risk for mild cognitive impairment, MCI, which is the pre-Alzheimer's state, and then succumb to dementia. But we have the green line, where you can continuously increase your cognitive capacity. This sounds like an infomercial, but I promise you it's not. It's coming from a scientist. We are able to increase our cognitive capacity. You know, the concept of wisdom is thrown around all the time. It's a soft concept, especially being a scientist, I don't use it. But you know, when you have so many memories, 
You have so many experiences. Your vocabulary increases as you live longer. When you put all of those together, that's cognitive capacity. There's going to be a little slowing of processing power. So for example, you know, it's like, you know, waiting a little bit to remember a word. I always give an analogy of a library. You know, think of yourself as a library during your, your mind as a library. When you're a kid, you're a small library. It's easy to find what book is where, you go get it, and then you come out, right? It takes, it takes a snap. But as we grow older, you become a New York public library. And if you want to go grab a book, you gotta go all the way down to the, to the shelf to grab a book and come back. So your speed of processing slows down, but man, the library is humongous. And that's what cognitive capacity is, and that's what we want to bring to fruition, to surface for the rest of our lives. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Prevention. Prevention is the new treatment, and we have so much evidence for it. What our research has shown is that there are four processes that actually start the process of dementia that push the disease. It's inflammation, oxidation, glucose or energy dysregulation, and lipid or fat dysregulation. Now, inflammation can happen with bad food, with lack of exercise, with bad sleep. Oxidation can happen with the same things. Inflammation can also happen if you have had multiple head injuries. Glucose dysregulation, obviously, because of bad food. And lipid dysregulation, also because of bad food. So, what are some of these things that counteract it? Nutrition, exercise, unwind or stress management, not necessarily getting rid of stress, but increasing our good stress, and I'll talk about that later. Restorative sleep, seven to eight hours of restorative sleep is critical for brain health. And then optimization of cognitive activity, you know, good stress for the brain, pushing ourselves, having a purpose in life, a purpose-driven life actually saves our brain, and that's what the Blue Zone people always talk about too. Purpose is important. So, we came up with a self-serving acronym, being neurologist, you know, we came up with this cute uh, acronym called NEURO. N stands for nutrition, E stands for exercise, U stands for unwind or stress management, R is for restorative sleep, and O is for optimizing cognitive activity. If we include all of these in our lives, and I'll tell you what they are, 90% of dementia can be prevented. And we've seen this over and over and over again at Loma Linda University where we work, at the California Teacher Study where I do research. We actually are a part of the Beach Cities Health District where they had the Blue Zones there and now we're actually doing research on cognition there. We see it over and over again that when people eat a whole food plant-based diet, if they exercise, if they have good stress, if they sleep, and if they keep their mind active, we don't see them, they don't come to the clinic. They never do. We only see people with a lot of vascular risk factors and other lifestyle factors that makes them succumb to dementia. So let's talk about nutrition because it's a veg fest, right? So I'll expand a little bit about it, but I promise you I'm not gonna bore you. I have a tendency to bore people because I love science and I'm a scientist, but I'll promise you I'll try my best not to bore you. So, unfortunately, when you go to hospital cafeterias, when you go to restaurants, when you go to school cafeterias, our foods are packed with saturated fat, with processed sugar and processed foods, and foods that are just so not close to their real, you know, real food. And these are the things that actually promote the inflammation, the oxidation, the glucose dysregulation, and the lipid dysregulation that I was talking to you about. And we're hoping to change it to something like this, more whole, unprocessed, plant-based diet. Things like vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, because they're packed with the necessary macronutrients and micronutrients that are amazing for that brain of ours. A couple of things. Now, there's a lot of there's a lot of debate about fat. Fat this, fat that, you know, butter is back on the Time magazine. Butter's never back, butter butter is dead, it was never there. We know for the past 30 years that cholesterol and saturated fat actually damage our brain. Remember those brain cells that I told you about? They actually break down those connections. Those 30,000 connections that we're trying to create are broken down with saturated fat. People who have high cholesterol during their midlife, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, they have a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. 
people who consume a lot of saturated fats and trans fatty acids that are found in packaged, processed foods, meats, cheese, dairy, they actually cause oxidation and inflammation. That's a fact, we've known this for a long time. Nutrition is not confusing people. There are a lot of people making it confusing, but we've had the data so far. And then people who actually switch from saturated fat to poly and monounsaturated fats that are found in avocados, nuts and seeds, and plants, they actually tend to do very well as far as their brain health is concerned. Low risk of Alzheimer's, low risk of Parkinson's, low risk of stroke, depression and anxiety as well. So all of that. This paper actually showed that when people have ApoE4, the gene for Alzheimer's disease, their risk of Alzheimer's disease went up by twofold. But if the same population had high cholesterol and high blood pressure, their risk went up by three times. So lifestyle can actually activate those genes. It's so important to know that you can shut these genes down by managing your risk factors in life. The Chicago Health and Aging Project, this is a paper that came out in 2003. They, in about 2,500 older adults, followed for seven years, they found that people who consumed high saturated fats and trans fatty acids, they had a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease compared to those who uh, consumed fats from plants. The Adventist Health Study, where I work, back in 1993, Dr. Paul Guillaume, who knows about the Adventist Health Study, by the way? So the Adventist Health Study is unique because they have vegetarians and non-vegetarians, and it's a really good population to study the effect of diet, and he found that people who consumed meat, including poultry and fish, had twice the risk of developing dementia compared to vegetarians, and that is true. When you go to those communities, when you see vegetarians, we barely see vegetarians. Out of the 3,000 people that my husband and I have seen in our clinic, in the dementia uh, prevention clinic at 